with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 36 as we continue our scripture reading and commentary through this Old Testament prophet that the Lord raised up to pronounce judgment on the tribes of Judah that remained and right now what we're about to read in this chapter, 36, it's just about 20 years before the Lord would bring Nebuchadnezzar down, and this would be the third time that Nebuchadnezzar would come down into the land, and this time it would be to destroy the city and the temple. Every delay in judgment, people became hardened and thought, well, Judgment hadn't come. It's like people today. They don't see the judgment of God immediately, so they presume they're okay. But what God has pronounced for judgment, he accomplishes. But here in Jeremiah chapter 36, we find the disregard of the king, Jehoiakim, for the word of the Lord because of the pronouncements that Jeremiah was making. It says that it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Remember, Josiah actually was a good king and had restored many of the things that had been destroyed by previous kings, brought back the reading of the word, destroyed idolatry in the land. And yet here's his son now who has taken over the throne and this was in his fourth year of reign that the Lord purposed he should reign, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations. So we see here that God is sovereign over all nations. He's not just the God of Israel. From the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. So here he's being instructed to take all these parchments that had been written by the Lord's direction and now to compile them into a book. And it says there, take thee a roll of a book. And clearly what we're reading here in Jeremiah would have been part of that, that book of instruction that contained not only what prophecies Jeremiah was given to speak, but even here now to write them down. He says, from the day that I spake unto thee, verse 2. Here we have an example of how the inspiration of scriptures took place. We're not sure exactly how the Lord would have spoken to these prophets, whether in an audible voice or by his spirit, but we know, according to what the New Testament says, that it was not of their own private interpretation that they wrote, but these spake as God gave them utterance by his spirit. And so in verse three, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. A lot of people, when they read that expression, it may be that they view God as waiting somehow for sinners to repent. And so here's another chance, they say, for them to repent. But God, when he expresses this language, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them. The Lord knows those that are his. He knows those that he's purpose should hear. But there's none that in the end, when God does bring judgment, that can say unto him, what doest thou? Because the Lord is merciful He's forbearing, even over the vessels of wrath, is what Paul says there in Romans, long-suffering. And yet, in no way 
Was there an expectation of God here? When it says, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. It's just laying it out there that should Israel turn from their wicked way, yes, God would indeed show mercy and grace, but the reality is left to themselves, which God doesn't owe salvation to any, it was certain that there was nothing but judgment that would await them. And so in verses 4 through 8, we see Barak, or Baruch, one of Jeremiah's servants. Then Jeremiah called Barak the son of Neriah. And Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon a roll of a book. So once again we see the inspiration of scriptures that as Jeremiah dictated what the Lord was directing him to say, here Barak, his servant, was taking and writing this upon a roll of a book. When this is all said and done, all of these parchments would have been put together so that in a roll, a scroll, when they unrolled them years later in the synagogue, these had one big uh, thing in the middle on which when they, when they opened it up from beginning to end, it was an entire book. So that's what we see taking place here. And Jeremiah commanded Barak, saying, I am shut up. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Jeremiah here was in prison. And so he himself could not take this at this time into the house of the Lord. That's why he engages Barak here. He says, therefore, go thou. Now, his prison would have been in a chamber within the palace of the king and yet restrained from being able to go up to the temple at this particular time. And so he gives this instruction to Barak, go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. It may be. Again, Jeremiah is speaking here as any one of us, not knowing how the Lord would be pleased to use his word. It may be that, he, that they will present their supplication before the Lord and return everyone from his evil way, for great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against his people. This is how those of us that preach in our day, we don't know how God will be pleased to use it, and yet we stand and declare the word exactly as has been communicated through these prophets. It says, Barak the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book, the words of the Lord, in the Lord's house. So you can picture him now standing there in the temple, opening up this word and declaring it unto the people. Verses 9 and 10, see, Barak himself was not the prophet, but he was the messenger of the prophet. Just like today, we're not apostles and prophets in the sense as they were in the Lord's day, but we declare <coughs> what the apostles and the prophets learned from the Lord. As Paul would say, as I have received of the Lord, so I delivered unto you. Verses 9 and 10, it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim. So this is one year later, because verse 1 says in the fourth year, now the fifth year, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, so almost two years later, one year, nine months later, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah unto Jerusalem. Sometimes we expect that there's going to be an immediate response to the word when it's read or declared. But here some time had passed. And notice, notice here 
that they proclaimed a fast. Who's they? Well, that's the people. With the Babylonians now at the door, you know, all this was going on, conquering all the nations that were surrounding Judah, the people felt that every measure should be taken, so here they called a fast before the Lord. At least it shows that they were taking seriously the word of the Lord, seeing even as Jeremiah had proclaimed that this would come to pass, that they would begin to seek the Lord. But there's a different way of seeking the Lord. There's one way of seeking him because of wanting to avoid judgment. We have the same thing today by so many that say, well, if we'll just humble ourselves and pray that God's going to spare our land. They pull that scripture out of context. And certainly here, these were the people from the cities of Judah that gathered themselves and proclaimed this fast. Notice they did it. It wasn't the king who proclaimed the fast. And so, again, you don't question people's motives. Just like here, Barak didn't say, well, you're trying to do this just to escape. What did he do? Verse 10, then read Barak in the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the ears of all the people. There were these chambers that surrounded the temple where certain ones of the priesthood had rooms where they would stay because they were about the ministry of the, of the temple, the tabernacle. And here was one the chambers called that of Gamaria, the son of Shaphan. And uh, he had been, back in 2 Kings, he had actually been the Secretary of State under Josiah, the king. And uh, so here was one that, even though others were unfaithful, the Lord had preserved him. And even Shaphan, his name here is the scribe. You often think, well, scribes, they were all bad. Here was one who wasn't. Here was one that had been, because it says here, Gamariah, the son of Shaphan, had been faithful to teach his son the word of the Lord and communicate it as a scribe. And the Lord was blessing his family for that reason. So then in verses 11 through 15, Barak now brings the scroll to the princes of Judah. It says, When Micaiah, the son of Gemari, the son of Shaphan, so this was another of that lineage, had heard out of the book all the words of the Lord, then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all the princes sat there, even Elishama, the scribe, and Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, and El Nathan, the son of Achbor, and Gamariah, the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. Then Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the ears of the people. So here's a story now based upon the word read. I hope we never minimize the importance of the word being read. Some will make that comment about our meetings, how much the word is read. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. We're not about special music or performances. The word read, that's what's vital. And that's what's causing this commotion right now. So verse 14, all the princes sent Yehudi, the son of Nathaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, unto Barak, saying, Take in thine hand the roll wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. So we see some stirring among the leadership. What began with the people now has reached the ears of the princes. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Barak read it in their ears. Notice down through how, how many times the reading of the word, the reading of the word, where you see 
some interest in hearing the word read, whether for good or evil. Because sometimes, as we're going to see here, when the word is read, what initially seemed to be for good, in reality, the more the word was read, the angrier they became. It's just like with our Lord in the synagogue there in Luke 4. When he stood up to read, everybody initially said, oh, how gracious are those words. But when the Lord said, the day is going to come when you're going to say unto me, physician, heal thyself, mocking him. And especially when he took that very same scripture and showed them his sovereignty in sending a prophet to the widow Sarepta, but to none of Israel, or to the leper, Naaman, but to none in Israel. Then the anger came out. And that's what we're going to read here in verse 16. Now it came to pass. And, and this is why I say this. We don't have to sort out who is and who isn't. Just continue to declare the word. Set Christ forth. And I've said before, it's like putting a, a bowl of water in front of a rabid dog. Because that's what rabies is. It's hydrophobia. When you put that water in front of a rabid dog, it's, it's going to react. And just people sit calmly and listen for a while. But when you begin to set Christ forth in all of his sovereignty in Scripture and declare that it's only his work and his alone that saves sinners, and it's not man's decision, it's the Lord who has determined who he'll save and who he won't, boy, you'll get a reaction from people. And it's all from the Word. So here... We see in verse 16, it came to pass when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and another, and said unto Barak, we will surely tell the king all these words. This is the first indication that this is not the Spirit directing them to Christ, because what's the very first thing that their response is? They're afraid, number one, why? Because of the king. If the king hears this, then we're all in trouble. So we got to figure out a way to break this to the king. It's like so many, when you first point them to the Christ of Scripture, and they're troubled in hearing that God saves whom he will. It's not man's decision, it's God's. What do people do? I better go talk to my pastor. That's really what we're seeing here. They asked Barak, saying, tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Then Barak answered them, he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Barak, Go hide thee. <laughs> Thou and Jeremiah, let no man know where ye be. Why? Because once this gets out, what, what we've just read, what were they reading? They pronounced judgment that was imminent upon Jerusalem from the Babylonian nation. Better hide yourself because this is going to be trouble. And they went into the king, into the court, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. They didn't bring the, the scroll. So the king sent Jehudi to fet the roll, and he took it out of Elisha the scribe's chamber, and Jehudi read it in the ears of the king. And in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now you can imagine, here they all stand. Where are they looking? They're not looking to the word. They're looking to the king. What's going to be the king's reaction? Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And he came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves. So these were the parchments that had been put together. But now, after three or four leaves... He cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. This shows the hardness of a depraved heart that would rather the word be destroyed than to bow to it than to hear it. It says, yet they were not afraid <coughs> nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants that heard all these words. See, this should have been an alarm already. You are burning the word of God and seeking to destroy it. 
This is the day before printing presses. So that meant the tediousness of writing all these words now burn up in a fire. There are a lot of people that think if they can just destroy the scriptures, then they can stop God from doing his work. The word is not bound. Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Gamariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the bull, but he would not hear that. This is an amazing thing. They're standing before a king that could give an order just to lop off their heads. So amongst all this unbelief, here now are these three, Elnathan, Deliah, and Gamariah, that had the courage to stand up to the king and tell him what he was doing was not right. But the king commanded Jeremiel, the son of Hamelech, and Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdeel, to take Barak the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet. But the Lord did that. So the Lord had already forewarned that they needed to hide themselves. And there's times when the Lord does that. He hid them. That's an amazing thing when the Lord can blind sinners so that they do not see. He's capable, and he does. There's times even with our Lord Jesus when they would have taken him and stoned him, and yet he walked in their midst. They sought him, but they could not find him. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. After that, the king had burnt the roll, and the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, But take thee again another roll. And write in it all the formal words that were in the first roll. You can't. Over history, there have been people that have tried to destroy this book that we're holding in our hands right now. And here it is. The Lord's preserved it down through the ages. Especially during the period of the Ottoman Empire. When the Muslims ran for hundreds of years in the... Uh, the lands, and their goal was to destroy every piece of scripture or document that had to do with the Bible. And they destroyed a lot of them. But here we are. We don't have the originals today of the scriptures. We have copies that were kept and preserved. The Lord purposely. And so here they were commanded to take and write again, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim, the king of Judah. Imagine the hardness of this king. Again, the son of Josiah, who had been a faithful king, but it doesn't pass from his father to son. Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burnt this roll, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy this land, and shall cause to cease from thence man and beast. See, that was their point of contention. That was the message. Very specific. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David. And his dead body shall be cast out in the day of, to the heat and the night to the frost. When it says he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, God had already purposed the seed of David to be preserved. It just wouldn't come through Jehoiakim. And I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity. Notice iniquity in singular. This is the sum of rebellion and unbelief, contesting against God and his glory that he's declared concerning his son. And I'll bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, upon the men of Judah, all the evil that I have pronounced against them that they hearken not. Then took Jeremiah another roll. Gave it to Barak the scribe. See, all this is going on. You say, well, where were they hiding? Because they were in the city. But it was the Lord that hid them. And none of this hindered the Lord from doing his work. Just like it says there in Daniel 4. Who will say unto him, what doest thou? Who can restrain his hand? Jeremiah took another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burnt in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. It was just an occasion for the Lord to continue to expand this word as the Lord gave others. That's what the Lord told his disciples. They weren't running behind the Lord with a dictation path. 
writing down the words. It was uh, the Lord said that when the Spirit would come, He would bring to remembrance those things that the Lord purposed should be preserved for us today, such as His work and His word. Gracious Father, I thank you for this portion to encourage to know that even in the face of opposition, that your word is accomplished and there's not one part of it that will fail according to what you have decreed. That's true in condemnation. It's also true in salvation. And even in the midst of all of this unbelief, there were those that you preserved, like Jeremiah and Barak and those three other scribes that you used to write and rewrite the word so that we could have it today to read. I pray that we would not treat it lightly, but every word that we read, that we truly be brought low at Christ's feet and desire to hear of him. We praise, honor, and glory in his precious name.